Hello, my darlings, and welcome back to This is Maria. Today, we're talking about physical objects that are also portals. I figured that that would be a fun topic. Specifically, we're going to dive into art, all kinds of art, paintings, sculptures, potentially movies, if you're a movie director, books, as well as um, mirrors. Mirrors are not creations of humanity. Well, I guess they are not in the sense that, you know, you would be an artist to create a mirror, but mirrors are also portals and hence they're relevant to this episode. All right, before we dive in, just a couple of housekeeping items. I am inviting you to join my healing circles. Healing circles are um, a live Zoom event uh, format that I'm offering, and I'm doing about one a month. And the upcoming um, topics are, um, there's one in January all about etheric wings, um, activating your etheric wings, activating your etheric body, your energy body. Um, and there is one in February, and that is about healing your throat center, all about being self-expressed, speaking your truth, living your truth. Um, so hopefully, um, this, you know, this resonates and you would come and check out, um, my future workshops on thisismaria.com in the tab live events. And this is Maria, Maria with a Y, just like all of my channels. All right, my darlings, let's dive into portals. It feels like it's rich territory. There's not a lot of awareness um, within humanity around what these portals mean. And the fact that a lot of artworks, works of art, are even portals in the first place. So let us start diving deep. Let us start uncovering the hidden truths and uh, from the energy perspective and seeing where we um, net out on the other side, where we come out on the other side. So any object of art, whatever that is, whatever format of medium you're working on is going to become a portal into the consciousness of the creator. Specifically, today I wanted to focus on art, visual art, so paintings, um, a little bit on sculptures, not so much, and then we can also dive um, deeper into movies and books as well uh, from the energy perspective, and then mirrors towards the end. That's the agenda. All right, so um, anytime you're creating something as an artist, uh, whether you intend to or not, it um, the object that you're creating is going to have an imprint of your soul. It's almost like parts of your energy and parts of your auric field are being imprinted into every single creation that you have. That is why you have creations in art that feel, feel high vibrational, and that's why you have creations in art that don't feel high vibrational. Now, only, you know, that ended there. And maybe let's start with the paintings because that is probably the most glaring example of what I'm going to be talking about. So it is very normal. It has become very normal to go to art galleries, to go to museums that display artwork. Um, it is considered a form of entertainment. It is considered to be a form of, you know, elevating your senses and, you know, inspiration, et cetera, et cetera. And while all of those things are true, there is the hidden aspect of going to museums and art galleries that perhaps is lesser understood, if at all understood. So every painting that you see, every painting that you interact with is a doorway and a portal into the mind of its creator, into the mind of the painter. Not only the mind, but their energetic state at the time of the creation of the painting. So whatever the artist was going through as they were creating the painting, that vibration is an added layer, an augmented layer into the painting. You do not see it with your physical eyes, but your body perceives it, or at least your subconscious does, right? And it is having an impact on you beyond just the visual um, elements of the painting. So every painting tells a story, and not always is the story the positive one. Now, of course, you know, you've probably all had experiences going to a museum where you resonate with some paintings and you really quote unquote like them. And then with other paintings, you're like, I dislike that or I don't get that. So usually what that means is, are you a vibrational resonance to the painter? If your own vibration is in, is either very close to or harmonious with the vibration of the artist, then you're going to most likely like the painting. Um, if your vibration is very far removed from the artist, whether it's lower or it's higher, you're not going to 
find anything special about the painting or you may dislike the painting. Um, so again, um, all the art that we like is based on resonance, right? So the arts, the, the art and the artists that you like tell you a lot about you, right? Who you are, you know, where you are in the journey. Now, let's talk about artists and their process of creation as well, because that is fascinating. Um, a lot of visual art, and that is, again, so misunderstood. A lot of visual art is actually creating art is a healing process, especially with paintings and um, a little bit with sculpture as well. So whether artists realize this or not, but an artist's life is a life of, yes, expression, but it's usually expressing some hidden facet of yourself in order to heal it. So the process of healing, uh, there are a lot of, you know, intuitive healers or a lot of energy healers that are listening to me. The process of healing is usually not a very, quote unquote, clean process. Stuff comes up during the process of healing, right? Very often you have to transmute dark energies. Um, like anything, like th think of like surgeries, right? Like there's a lot of mess, blood, you know, sometimes you have to cut out things out of the body um, that are not pretty, right? Before the, the person, the patient can be stitched up and can be perfectly healthy again. So the process of healing is not always beautiful. And so as the artist is going and, you know, um, say the artist is trying to figure out what their next painting is, and then they, they get inspired. Little do they know uh, that the reason something inspired them um, is because they're meant to go through a particular facet of healing. And usually in the old days, you know, paintings took a while to complete. You know, it could be a year for uh, for someone to complete a, pa a painting. If it's a massive painting, it would be two, three years. So it was like a long-term healing process. And the entire roller coaster of emotions that somebody felt is going to be depicted in that painting. So not only as the person is painting and they're going through their own healing, they're creating this imprints of the healing process, which is not always pretty. So energetically, kind of like that, it's almost like the behind the scenes of the painting is not pretty. Energetically, it's kind of like if you were to create and collect kind of like a lot of dust <laughs> um, and, and dirt and debris, that is kind of like the back layer of all the paintings. Are you guys familiar? I think it's the, um, the 25th frame. Um, so like with subliminal programming, sometimes on TV, um, they would include... Um, an additional frame, and it is so quick that your eye doesn't perceive it, but it could be used in, in you know, uh, with, um, for the re for the purposes of, you know, quote unquote, advertising something or, you know, steering the, the collective consciousness of humanity or collective consciousness of a particular region towards a particular outcome, right? Especially it's programming, it's visual programming. With paintings, although it is not intentionally done, but it's like that concept of the uh, 25th frame is very, um, it's very present because you are kind of getting the entire download of somebody's auric field at the time of painting creation as you're just looking at it, whether you'd like this or not. So if the person, I'll give you an example. If the person was worried about money, and a lot of painters, by the way, were, because the archetype of the starving artist is very real. If the painter was worried about money, um, if the painter uh, had a sick mother, if the painter's wife just miscarried a baby, if uh, the painter, I don't know, was um, um, has had a large, uh, sorry, a big um, inner critic, all of those things are going to be reflected in the painting. And so as you are coming in contact with that painting in the gallery, and especially if you spend a significant amount of time observing the painting, you are absor absorbing more than just the visual aspect of the painting. The number one thing that you are absorbing are the energies of that person. Now, there have been painters that have been very happy and that, that had, had harmonious lives, but very often uh, painters, because they're so in tune, almost like with their soul, there's so there's like no barrier, and that's why art is so deep. It goes straight to the level of the soul, uncovering some of the things that need to be healed. That's why very often the life of an artist is perhaps emotionally not very stable because again you are in tune with like your entire subconscious, right? That's where you draw your inspiration, quote unquote, from. Um, inspiration in in, a, in in this case is the same thing as a nudge to heal something, right? So all of these paintings end up in galleries um, or sometimes they, you know, they ended up in, um, in, in, you know, in homes of the patrons of, of the painters. 
Uh, and then every painting, of course, went through many owners if it is um, a successful a painting of a successful artist. And so the paintings initially already had a particular vibration as they were being created. And on top of everything else, they absorbed as, you know, as portals. They have also absorbed the energy of the places where they used to hang on the wall. And so um, I guess where I'm going with this is it's like every painting and like looking at paintings is, is like playing the lottery. You don't know what you're going to get. And a lot of the energies, because of the starving artist archetype that you may be getting through the painting are not necessarily optimal. So, um, you know, you could just pick up on certain vibrations, they rub off on you, all of a sudden you start feeling the same thing as the painter was feeling. And this is even more so true when you are purchasing a painting for your house. Um, it's essentially like purchasing the vibration of the artist. You're purchasing kind of like a sliver of the soul of that artist. Um, it doesn't, I don't mean that it's like literally like an aspect of the soul comes, um, you know, like splits itself from the higher self and starts living in the painting. But the vibrational imprint is so strong, but that is almost the case. And so you're buying that and you're placing that in your home. That energy of that painting is really going to shift the overall vibration of your dwelling. And the bigger the painting, the bigger the impact. You know, these huge paintings in uh, rich homes that, you know, cover half the wall or the, like the entire wall, that is really going to change the vibration of your home, whether you'd like this or not, just because it's like you literally brought a portal into your house and hung it on the wall. So be careful what you bring into your house um, as far as paintings, because not only are you bringing the, you know, what, whatever is the, is being depicted, right? So for instance, let's say um, it's, it's a war scene. What are the odds that the depiction of a war scene has a very, very high frequency and high vibration? Pretty much close to zero. So that is the vibration that you're bringing into your house, just to just take it at face value, right? Um, now, of course, paintings such as, and you, you may be counteracting me like, okay, Maria, well, what about paintings of nature? Because that's beautiful. What about paintings of, mm, you know, like um, fruits and vegetables for like beautiful settings on the table or something? Um, that's all fine. Like at face value, like there is nothing wrong with like, looking at a beautifully drawn mug or like, uh, you know, uh, apple. However, that is where the energy of the painter becomes really, really important. Again, what was the painter going through at the time? What were they healing at their soul level through that painting? What were they thinking about as they were creating it? What was going on in their life? Because that is going to still transfer into your world as you're just staring at the apple that is drawn on, on, on the painting. Now, the question that I'm getting from the collective is what if, it, what if it is not the original painting, but a reproduction of the painting, right? So a copy. Okay, if the copy is made with um, um, paint, right? So it's not like um, a photo of something. That is, um, then the vibration of that copy is going to have two different artists imprint. The imprint of the person who originally drew the painting and then the imprint of the person who copied the painting. So both of these are going to be intertwined. And uh, from that perspective, it's even more risky because then it's double the chances that, you know, somewhere, something somewhere in that, in the org field of one of these two people wasn't right. Now, if it is a photocopy to a lesser degree, but that is still true. When it is a photo of a painting, it is still a portal. It's not quite as strong. It's, you know, uh, its power is diminished compared to the original. However, you're going to get the same exact portal. The, like the vibration of that portal is going to be the same. If the original is vibrating, call it at the frequency of number five, then the photocopy of that is going to also vibrate at the frequency of number five. It's just the saturation of that vibration is going to be lower. The saturation of a photo uh, pho photo um, copy of something is about 30% of the original, just so um, you guys are aware. It's still a lot. And again, it depends on the size of that um, copy, right? If the photo is small, it's much smaller. If the photo is half of your wall, it's a porno. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. And it's going to uh, really, really um, change the vibrations of the house. Um, now, there is another thing that I wanted to say. Okay, you guys. Um, just so you're aware, uh, and by the way, you can uh, set like a quick prote protection for yourself um, before listening to this this next point. Um, imagine there is like a dome of white light um, right above your head. 
and um, you are protected from, you know, anything that, you know, um, that may come through your auric field. Um, as I mentioned, the next thing, uh, portraits is something else entirely. Have you guys seen portraits that look like they're alive? Like their eyes are alive? Okay. There is a reason why. There are all of these spirits that are out there. You know, different astral spirits, different energetic entities that are fly flying around, even ghosts of people who, um, of beings who have passed on, but not quite passed on. One of the things that these entities want is a body. And obviously, uh, unless they can find a body to quote unquote possess, which is like its own set of things. And, you know, it's really hard to do, actually. Um, they're looking for other ways um, to pretend like they have a body. And portraits is one such way. And so a lot of these entities actually like going into portraits um, and kind of like look through their eyes, pretending like they have a body. So personally, I would never purchase a portrait for my own house. And even having your own portrait made um, still opens up the same kind of door uh, for spirits to inhabit that portal. Um, because they're just literally going to be watching you through the eyes of the portrait. Is it a little creepy? Yes. Is it also true? Yes, I'm so sorry, but it is, it is what it is. Does it mean that every single portrait is inhabited by an entity? Absolutely freaking not. There are only some portraits, maybe about 10%. Um, the rest of them are not, right? So like maybe you have a portrait and that's completely fine. But for me, a 10% chance of like an entity living in my house just because I chose to create a portrait of, my, of myself, eh, not necessarily my favorite. That's that. Also, if you guys still um doubt um the fact that the artist imprints what they are into the creation then think about um all of the um creators and artists that um made icons um like you know um meaning icons um so essentially all these like um like artists that worked uh, for churches and and tried to create like the the images and the visages of like Jesus and Mother Mary and all of like holy, uh, the holy people, the saints. Very often, um, prior to undertaking a commission, when you're supposed to depict Jesus, um, whether that is a painting or, you know, um, a sculpture, doesn't really matter. Um, if, if the person who commissioned that painting, um, knows what, you know, what they're asking for, um, they would very often ask the artist to go through a very rigorous fasting um, uh, regimen and an ascesis where the artist would have to give up a lot of things because they had to almost like earn the um, the purity of their physical vessel as an artist. They had to be pure enough to be able to translate what, in this case, Jesus, just as an example, Jesus is obviously not the only example, um, but... Um, uh, in order to translate the purity of Jesus and not tarnish that um, image uh, with their own um, vibration, the artist very often would have to go into fasting and like some, you know, some very, very rigorous fasting. So very often they would have to give up meat and, you know, uh, like alcohol. And uh, sometimes it would last for years, if not decades. So, um, you know, working on that kind of art that was, you know, call it religious art, is very much a commitment. Not everybody can produce high-frequency artwork. In fact, it's really, really hard on the face of planet Earth to produce high-frequency artwork. Why? The art works almost like unintentional, right? Uh, as a healer, as I've already mentioned before. And, and it's not like as an artist, you can control and say and choose to not go through a healing if the universe believes you need the healing or your higher aspects believe you need the healing. So if you set out to create a painting and there is, quote unquote, darkness in your vessel, I don't know, some karmic nods that need to be addressed, um, something big that's coming up for you emotionally, mentally, whatnot, you cannot just like put yourself out of the picture, no pun intended, and just like pretend that you're not the part of the process as an artist, because just because you want to create a high vibrational um, art and you're like, okay, let me put all of my karma on the back burner. Let me put all of my negative thoughts in the back burner, negative feelings, and I'm going to try to come into this as a pure vessel. If you don't have the purity of the vessel, you cannot fake it with art. Art is extremely real and it's very, very telling. It's almost like somebody as an artist, it's like 
um, if you're trying to understand um, like um, what somebody vibrates at, ask them to draw a painting. Uh, and by that, you're going to understand exactly what is what it is that they're hiding. Because all of their undercurrents, all of their traumas, all of their dramas, all, like all of the past life is going to be encapsulated smack in the middle of that painting. And so, um, in other words, the reason it's so hard to create high vibrational art is because it means that you as a soul have to A, come with a very, very pure vessel and B, not um, accumulate new karma at the to the extent that a lot of people accumulate new karma. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to produce anything of purity, right? Because again, every painting is actually a reflection of your soul, if that makes sense. Kind of like the, the, the portrait of Dorian Gray. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and um, again, the, um, the other part is sometimes um, people, um, painters, what have you, create their true masterpieces later in life. Why does that happen? Is that because their level of skill is, is, is growing? And yes, while that is the case, as the artist undergoes the process of uh, creating things, it could be sculptures, could be paintings, doesn't really matter. They are almost like clearing out their vessel with every painting, right? Um, so every painting is going to contain the imprint of their trauma, but they have gotten rid of that imprint. And so, you know, with the painting, that trauma is gone. Then onto the next painting. And so with every painting, they become a clearer and a clearer vessel. As a general rule, there are exceptions to every rule. And so towards the end of their life, they're going to be able to produce really beautiful works that are untarnished, so to say, by um, the distortions because there are fewer distortions. Now, uh, where that is not the case is if a person is going through something major in their lifetime and it's almost like you're seeing the darkening of their soul and the choices that they make lead, lead them down, down the darker path. That would be a, an example where the paintings get worse with age or shall we say not worse, but like energetically more disturbing with age. Um, instead of the opposite. Um, that's paintings. Sculptures kind of follow the same imprint, um, uh, only it's a different medium, right? Um, or they follow the same exact rule, or the same exact rule applies, right? You bring a sculpture into your house, you bring the energy of the sculpture, you bring all of their thoughts, all of their feelings, and even a portion of their karma. And sculptures actually, because it's like an embodiment, even more so because like paintings are flat, Sculptures are actually usually, I'm not usually, they're always 3D dimensional. They are even going to absorb parts of the karma of the sculpture. And so that is what you're buying. Uh, and now it is your karma. So, you know, what are the odds that you've been given good karma? Not great odds on planet Earth, not great odds. Um, now, I would say that sculptures of people and beings are probably um, a little bit heavier um, karmic carriers as opposed to like. Again, a sculpt, you know, a sculpture of a vase or something, or like a, I don't know, a, a banana or an apple. That does not tend to mm, carry um, a lot of karma. It's more things that are anthropomorphic, things that kind of like remind a body, like a human body, where um, like the imprint really, really happens quite heavily. Just because also there are mirror neurons, right? Like you guys are familiar with mirror neurons, but. Um, you know, everything in, in, in the world is a reflection of something else. So as a painter, or sorry, as a sculptor in this case, as you are sculpting, um, you know, a figure, you are going to give that figure, whether you realize this or not, some of your personal qualities as a being, as a soul, right? And that means some of your karma. And that is how it can walk into the collector's house. Same is also true for artistic creations, for directors of movies. So movies are always, always a reflection of the director. Now, you may argue with me and, you know, you may tell me, Maria, there are hundreds of people um, that are taking part in um, creating every single Hollywood movie or any other kind of movie. And yes, that is also the case. But the director is really the one that shapes uh, the movie the most because they're, they're the one in charge. And so very often the imprint of the movie um, is going to have director's signature, right? And that is really, really clear. Um, you, guys, you guys, for instance, I don't know, a Tim Burton movie has a signature because his soul has a particular signature that is very, very recognizable, but that is a quick example to you. Um, James Cameron, if you see, has a very different signature and the types of movies that he sh shoots are very, very different. 
he actually um, operates at the heart level. So um, his movies push the, the heartstrings. Um, so uh, it's, you know, and, and that those are very, very quick examples of how the director influences the movie. So in other words, the same process that the artist undergoes as they're creating a painting, a movie director undergoes as they are making a movie, right? So it's like essentially a personal healing project for the director of the movie uh, or a personal adventure project, a personal exploration project. And that is going to contain a crazy amount of the imprint of that person, right? And, right, um, it's almost like watching the movie of that particular director is going to be inviting their auric field into your house and into your auric field, right? So again, be careful what you, you know, what you watch, um, who you watch, who you tune into, because you, bec um, you become them essentially, right? Like you're, you, by allowing something into your auric field, um, an adjustment is going to start um, taking place and a little bit of the a copy paste phenomenon, right? So your auric field is going to copy some of the things from somebody else's auric field. Um, if you are exposed to their creation for long enough, and the movie is usually a long enough endeavor, and especially if the movie influences you emotionally, whichever feeling that is, love, hate, fear, um, you know, um, it's still an influence. Uh, books. Books are interesting. While books, just like, um, just like movies, are a reflection of the author and their world, Books are portals. They're only partially portals into the auric field of the author, but books are portals into the world that they have created. And so um, very often the authors, you know, that are creating books, um, and the same thing, I guess, is true for script writers. Anybody who's a writer that's creating a world or creating something from scratch, they're going to create an egregore, right? Like an energetic structure, a world with its own rules and its characters, etc. Um, and um, that world, that egregore, initially obviously stems from the author and is fed by the author's energy. And then down the road, that egregore is going to be fed by every reader um, or every, you know, now people listen to books, so every listener of the book, I guess. Um, and so that becomes like an, an energetic, energetic structure that grows. Uh, but at the same time, you are communicating as a reader what you are most in touch with is the world that, that the author has created, right? And that world is going to have its own vibration. It's going to have its own mental body. It's going to have its own emotional body. Um, and all of that has initially been fed into the project by the author. Now, the author is also very often undergoing a particular healing experience through the book, right? There are either... Um, it could be either healing or they're just trying to explore something, right? So very similar to directors. And the exploration of something is like a new experience that the author wants to have, and they want to kind of like live vicariously through their characters. But at the same time, um, you would notice, right, like a lot of authors would write themselves into their main characters. Uh, and there is always that, that association of like, okay, well, if I were a character, I'd probably be this character. And because of that, they're writing their own traumas into that character, and they're undergoing the healing as the main character is undergoing the healing. And, you know, as somebody who is looking at that character, you know, um, empathizing with that character, reading about that character, you inadvertently are going to experience a smaller facet of that same trauma that the character is experiencing, right? Because of all your mirror neurons. Um, so that is another thing to, um, to be aware of. But at the same time, you know, um, every world is going to have an imprint on you, right? Everything that you read, everything that you come in contact with is going to rub off on you. So when reading books, just like when watching movies, be mindful because uh, the author's energies are going to become your energies. And also with books, you spend way more time reading a particular book that you usually spend with a movie. So you you know, it may be advisable for you to be even more careful with the books you read than even the movies that you watch. Although that, you know, we can say that that is debatable because the visual information from the movie could be so impactful. You know, seeing one scene of murder could, you know, could last you for a lifetime. And, you know, you may not forget that. Uh, of course, when you're reading it, you know, you have your own imagination to protect you. So, you know, it depends. But some people, um, you know, um, d depending on how you are set up as a human, 
can get influenced by their own imagination even more so than the things that they see. So depending on your level of sensitivity. But I think overall, just be aware of, right, that any creation of any artist, any creation of any human being is always going to carry their imprint. Um, that is why, even like with healing modalities, right, if there is a person, there is a person that created human design, for instance, there is a person that created Reiki. Um, anytime you have a creator of something, of a modality, that modality is going to have an imprint of that person, of that original creator. What do I mean by that? Not only their auric field, but also their intention. Because creations are incredibly in touch with intentions of their creator, right? It's like the intention is really what sets the trajectory. So if somebody wants to, um, you know, um, if somebody creates a modality because they want to spread light and love, that's one type of intention. If somebody wants to create a modality, a healing modality, because they want to become famous for creating a healing modality, it's a whole other intention. Either way, you're absorbing that imprint, right? So just be mindful. Um, and the egregore that is being created from that you know, healing modality is going to behave according to that um, original intention. So because of that, some egregores are predatory and they're really succulent and others are okay and they're just going to let you be and, and hang out and they're less predatory. Um, that's that. I wanted to maybe um, quickly get to, oh, there's one more thing, theater. Sorry. I might as well talk about theater. Theater is the same thing. Um, whoever, so um, the script writer, whoever wrote the original story, that's the person that um, is donating the most uh, in terms of their energy imprint into the, the play. Also, of course, um, whoever was the director of the play, whoever put it all together, as well as, um, you know, to a, a large degree actors, right? Especially with, um, and that is also true with actor actors in movies, right? Like they're donating their energy, absolutely. But when you're watching somebody live, that impact is even more present because you're literally sharing the room with them. You're sharing the same space with them. So you're going to be very, very much impacted. Um, and, and you're going to start vibrating closer to that frequency upon leaving the theater, right? So mind you, it's almost like you come as an empty vessel into the play, then something is being poured into you. And then you walk out vibrating at the frequency of the play. La Phantom of the o um, Opera, it's about a haunted theater. So there you go. Like, what do you think you're going to vibrate at after watching it? You know, you decide. There is no right and wrong. There is, you know, the information that we are given and the choices that we make based on that information. Nothing that I, you know, I have said means that don't partake of the arts. Absolutely not. If you feel like you want to partake of the arts, you should partake of the arts. If you feel the art elevates your frequency, then go for it, right? There is no right or wrong. Just be mindful, be aware. And, you know, that, that, that's all on that. Mirrors. Mirrors are freaking fascinating. Mirrors are really, truly portals. And they're portals into different worlds. Um, but it's usually, um, it's what, what I mean by worlds, it's, it's almost like a different level of vibration within Gaia. Um, so there is that concept of the nine worlds within the Nordic mythology. Uh, there are different, um, um, not even different versions of Gaia, but there are different worlds kind of like um, uh, located along the Yggdrasil tree, the, um, the central axis. Um, there are, if you think about it, like um, planet Earth um, doesn't, you know, there are, if we were to kind of like dissect what planet Earth is, it has multiple versions of itself that vibrate at different frequencies. And I don't mean 3D versus 5D versus 7D. We're talking a third dimensional reality only for now, right? Even within the third dimensional reality, you have multiple versions, um, uh, like multiple layers of vibration. Certain things in, in 3D vibrate a little bit higher. Certain things in 3D vibrate a little bit lower. So uh, portals, um, mirrors are portals into all of these kind of like uh, up and down, not even dimensions, but like vibrational frequencies. And um, very often um, certain astral entities or energetic entities would use mirrors as portals just to, you know, to gaze into someone's life or like observe um, or sometimes get through. Um, so mirrors are challenging. I would not recommend slipping next to a large mirror. 
uh, not to fear monger because I, I mean nothing listen nothing is going to happen from the perspective is like nothing is going to murder you like no absolutely freaking not like no 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 that's not going to happen but but there are energy entities energetic entities out there and not all of them are shall we call it benevolent there are a lot of energetic entities that like feeding off of human energy a ton and you know if they got hungry and somehow got through to you <laughs> through the portal, um, you know, they could feed off of you. Usually, though, they need access to the face. So it's it's okay to have a small mirror in the bedroom, but just make sure that your face is not directly visible from the mirror. And if you need to cover the mirror, like let's say you are at a hotel or Airbnb and the mirror is positioned weird, either flip it if you can to the back um, for protection purposes or just cover it with a sheet or like a blanket or something. And you're going to notice that you sleep better. Um, you don't have weird dreams. Well, you may still have weird dreams, but at least these dreams are not going to be prompted by the entities coming out of the mirrors. Um, and if you are sensitive, if you are a sensitive being, you will definitely know. It's like literally you can have an experiment um, of, you know, trying to sleep next to a mirror. And like when you turn off the lights, feel like you will feel um, the presence, right? And then, um, you know, cover the same mirror and like do the next night when the mirror is covered. And you're going to notice that there's no presence in the room, right? In other words, large rooms in bedrooms when you're most vulnerable, when you're sleeping, right? Not recommended. Um, you know, fine. If, if, if you, you know, obviously you, we need mirrors. Like you guys need mirrors. That's totally cool. Um, just be mindful that when you're in your most vulnerable, probably a mirror is not such a great idea. Also mirrors, they absorb, like the portal goes both ways, right? Like not only can mirrors be used for somebody to watch over you, quote unquote, but mirrors also absorb your own emanations when you're looking into the mirror. So for example, if you put on weight and you're looking at the mirror every day and you're like, oh, put on weight. And then you become so sad. Like 30 days in, that mirror is going to start reflecting to you something else. It's going to be a sad mirror, if that makes sense. Or if you come up to the mirror and every morning you use the same mirror, like to look at yourself and, you know, you smile and you're like, you are the cutest thing ever. That mirror is going to carry that imprint of you're the cutest thing ever and translate it back to you, right? So like mirrors can be charged. They are charged with a particular energy. Older mirrors and antique mirrors are kind of like a lottery as well, kind of like paintings, because depending on where the mirror was hung, what, you know, what house, you know, who was looking at it, under what circumstances, what, what they were feeling, what they were thinking, that is going to determine the frequency at which the mirror vibrates at. And so I you know, just be careful with antique mirrors. You're much better off buying a new mirror because the new mirror, you're starting from a blank slate and you know that no funny business was happening with that mirror, right? It's yours. At least, you know, it's going to have your vibration. And if it's going to be a sad mirror, at least it's going to be your sad mirror, not somebody else's sad mirror. Because imagine buying the, um, the mirror um, where the lady, um, from a lady that looked at it and was sad because she thought she put on extra weight. All of a sudden, you start looking in the mirror and you don't like yourself. And you're like, did I put on weight? I don't think so. Why do I feel a little like I did? And the reason that you do is because the lady that looked at that mirror, the previous owner, looked at it and that was the thought form that she imprinted into the mirror. All of a sudden, you're picking up on it. And because, you know, Maybe you're, it's hard to be discerning every single moment of every single day. And it's very hard to identify where the thoughts are coming from. And so you may internalize that thought as being your own, whereas it was somebody else's, the owner of the mirror. Another thing, and there are a lot of superstitions actually around mirrors, you know, if, if, if you kind of scan the, the global human collective, but there is one about broken mirrors and broken mirrors are, you know, in a lot of cultures are supposed to be bad luck and like you're supposed to toss away the, um, the, the broken mirror. From the energetic perspective, the mirror that um, has a crack, there is like a chasm between um, the two sides of the mirror. And that actually even broadens the portal. And that creates a portal um, for like lower entities um, to come through that usually don't have access to this time-space reality. But they can only do it if somebody's looking in the mirror and interacting because they need kind of like that energy boost that they can get from the person looking in the mirror and interacting with the mirror. So 
I would not recommend, like, even if your mirror is a little bit broken, I would not recommend, like, doing makeup with it or something. Just get yourself a new mirror or, you know, borrow a mirror, something, you know, don't, don't really, yeah, it's from the energy perspective, unless you want to attract entities. And again, none of, <laughs> I want to say none of this is meant as fear mongering, but now, now, like, what I'm present to you is some of you guys are really afraid of these entities. Listen, entities are everywhere. Entities are everywhere around us. It doesn't like a. You may have strong protections, and that may never bother you in a million years. Um, you guys shouldn't be going about your day worrying about entities. That is absolute. That should be the last thing on your mind. What you should be, you know, mindful of is keeping your vibrations high, doing the right thing, being on your path, meditating daily, eating right, connecting with your higher self, and you're golden, right? So there is nothing about energetic entities that is inherently bad. More often than not, they are humanity's teachers. However, entities can also be tricky in the moment because they can feed off of your energy. They can put um, certain mental um, frames, like mental constructs inside of your mind that are not very pleasant thoughts. They can um, give you emotions that are not your own, that are not pleasant emotions, etc. So they can impact you, they can influence you, right? If there is a back door through which they can enter into your auric field. It doesn't mean that we now all should be afraid of mirrors because it just happened to be portals. Not every single mirror is an active portal. Like most portals are actually not active. Most portals are not active. Just in general, in life, right? Most portals actually, because like opening a portal um, is energy consuming. Somebody needs to provide the energy. Usually if the entity is opening the portal, the entity is providing the energy. If the entity has the right passcodes or access codes, right, uh, it is energy consuming. So I would say maybe about at any given point in time, only two, between two and 5% of mirrors are like an open and active portal. But again, just being mindful, specifically around mirrors, don't put them in your bedroom if you can help it, or if you do phase them away from, <laughs> from your face. Turn them away from your face as you're sleeping and um, don't look into broken mirrors and don't buy antique mirrors. I think that is like the regular, it's just the normal hygiene with mirrors and then you're set. Then you don't have to worry about it. Okay. I wanted, there are questions from the collective on this. Oh my God, so many. I can take only a few. Um, if you have a question that serves a collective, um, I'm here to receive. The question is from an artist, actually. Okay. Um, I'm an artist and I want to create conscious art. I want to create mindful art. I don't want to make people's lives miserable by, um, you know, creating a portal into my suboptimal auric field. But I'm also going through things. And uh, what would you recommend that I do? Because, you know, that's how I make my money. But I'm also not necessarily happy right now. So do I not create art? No, actually, I think you should create art. Um, art is a medium, as a form has been created so that humanity can start healing itself, can heal itself in a very organic way, right? That is a means of soul healing. So yes, absolutely, you should paint. And yes, you should, you know, for sure, um, sell your paintings because it's all going to be a vibrational match and a vibrational resonance. Whoever is going to buy your painting is somebody who probably needs the same kind of healing as you do. As, and as you heal yourself, you're going to be imprinting some of those healing frequencies into your painting. And perhaps that is the door, the way, the road that the person who's going to be buying the painting needs. So yes, do create art. I am for art. I am pro art, right? But again, the vibrational frequency, um, you know, it is a, it's a, it's a very real tool, right? And, and so I think just being aware of what you're creating is, is really important. At the same time, I do think as an artist, right, like if, if, if you're asking me like, um, you know, how could I possibly raise my vibrations, you know, eating lighter foods, right, like potentially giving up on meat, um, you know, definitely giving up on alcohol 100 um, percent, you know, not doing synthetic drugs. All of those things are really going to elevate your vibration as an artist and make sure that you're spreading as much light to the people around you, to the people who are going to be, you know, looking at your painting as possible, right? So there is a responsibility. You have a responsibility for humanity. And, you know, if you feel called to clean up your vibration, more power to you. And you can only be a better artist because of that. Okay, I'm here to receive the next question. Um, the question is interesting. 
The question is: so can we charge our mirrors with positive intentions and positive thoughts? 100 percent In fact, I think you should. Um, especially the mirrors that you use a lot, like the mirror in your bathroom, for instance, when you're brushing your teeth, that one, you always want to infuse it with positive thought forms. So mirrors um, react very well to thought forms, mental constructs. So what you want to be doing is using language and using thought forms to program the mirrors. So you may be standing in front of the mirror and it's, it's like mirrors are really, really good absorbers. Absorbers? Absorbents? <laughs> of spells. They absor absorb spells very well. And by spells, I don't mean witchcraft, but any essentially intentional statement is a spell, especially when it's said out loud and more than once. The same thing repeated. Like any statement that you repeat three times is already a spell. And so you can charge your mirror for abundance, for instance. Like you may look at yourself in the mirror and be like, wow, you are so abundant looking at yourself, right? Just, you know, and um, stating the fact that you are abundant. The mirror is going to remember that you told it that you are the person who is abundant. And then, you know, the more times you say that you're, you're abundant or you're joyful or you're lovely or you look great today, whatever is this, the thought form that you would like to infuse into the mirror, the mirror is going to, you know, um, kind of store it. It's going to accumulate it. And then eventually it's going to start giving it back to you, shining that... Um, uh, same um, frequency back to you so you can actually be um, nurtured by it. Right. So yeah, I actually like the practice. So thank you so much uh, for bringing it up. I will take another question. Anything about art, the energy of art, etc. So would you not recommend going to art galleries? No, I would not not recommend going to art galleries. Listen, to each his own. However, you may benefit from setting energetic protections before you do go so that when your auric field comes across like all of this information and all of these karma and all of this drama from thousands of painters and sculptors and artists, at least you're not absorbing everything like a sponge, right? Um, it can be a very simple energetic protection. It can be a simple sphere of light that you put above yourself with a specific intention to protect you from anything that is not in your highest good as you're browsing a gallery. And that is going to be good enough. And, you know, all of the things that are not yours, all the things that are not in, in, in your highest good, not in alignment, they're just going to be repelled off of your auric field. I would definitely recommend that. I think that galleries are actually, they're okay, just because usually, like, what are the odds that you're going to spend 30 minutes staring at the same painting? What I would caution against is the art that you buy um, the art that you buy for, um, for your houses, that one really be careful about really try to understand the artist, meet the artist if you can and get a feel for their energy. Are you comfortable in their energy? Do you see there's anything wrong with them? Are you getting a weird feeling? Like, would you be friends with that person? Because if not, maybe you shouldn't be buying their art because there's going to be, you know, um, all, the, all this hidden energies. Um, and then the other thing is if you're staying somewhere and it has art and the art piece is not giving you warm fuzzies, feel free to remove it off the wall and just flip it. And so that the front is facing the wall and you're no longer seeing that. And you're going to feel better in that space because it's, it's almost like that closes the portal and um, it does not impact your auric field or your mood or any of that. Right. So like just be mindful of the artwork in... Um, in hotel rooms and like Airbnbs, because again, they can impact your energy. They can impact your experience and you may not even know that. Well, this one, this was, was such a fun topic. Um, it got a little bit heated. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please let me know in the comments how you felt about this and if, what you're resonating with. Um, and you've, if you've been suspecting this, thank you so much. Send me a big virtual hug and see you in the next one. Bye loves.